Hello and welcome to Big Picture Monday. My name is Callie Black here with all the context you need to totally rock this week's Come Follow Me readings. This week we are studying Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, and then John chapters 5 and 6. Believe it or not, we have not been in the book of John for like two months. <laughs> so I'm very excited. I think you're going to love the chapters that we're reading in John this week. There's some really good stuff. Okay, a couple things of housekeeping first. First of all, this weekend is general conference. So excited about that. So I just invite you as you're doing your Come Follow Me study this week to also find ways to prepare for general conference, whatever that looks like for you. Maybe it's praying about the questions you're going to ask. Maybe it's studying past general conference talks, combination of the both, whatever, whatever fits for your lifestyle and your needs right now. I just invite you in some sort of way. The Lord loves effort, right? So what's one little way you can put some effort into preparing for general conference, even if that's making sure your kids have what they need in order to be occupied so you can focus more on general conference. That counts as preparation as well. I'm with you on that. Um, other thing is that next week is Easter week. We're already here at Easter week. Um, I do not have Big Picture Monday videos for Easter week, so you will not have a video for me next week. I'll be back again in two weeks once we're back in the Come Follow Me readings. It's kind of a unique year this year with Easter um, because we're literally studying Jesus's life and now it's like we're going to skip forward <laughs> to study Easter week because we're actually going to study the Easter scriptures very in depth throughout the month of June and the first week of July as well. So <laughs> we will get more in depth study of them later on, um, but it'll be great to, of course, skip ahead and talk about one of the most important events absolutely ever um, as we study the Savior's resurrection next week. So I'll be back with you in two weeks. Last thing is that this is now the first week of April. <laughs> Lots of stuff going on, which means it's the start of second quarter. So make sure to pull out your second quarter study guide if you have the big picture and little picture study guides that I create. If you don't have one yet, I create these because I want to help you feel confident as you're studying. I want you to feel confident with what's going on with the scriptures and feel confident with how to then apply the scriptures to your life because I believe the scriptures can change our lives literally every day. Just a little bit every day. Imagine all those little changes that can add up. Um, so if you haven't gotten your copy yet and you want this for the next three months to just feel totally confident and make your study a little bit easier, um, head to my website, comefollowmestudy.com. You can get a download of it right now. Or if you're okay with waiting a few days for Amazon to deliver it to you, you can also grab the link there or you can comment below and I'll DM you the links if you're having trouble finding them. Okay, this week I love our scripture assignment because I feel like it's this beautiful balance of things that Jesus did, like amazing miracles that he performed, and things that Jesus taught. It's like this perfect balance of both. We are going to learn so much about Jesus, <laughs> both through his actual teachings, like a lot of his teachings this week are focused on himself, like who is Jesus? What is his role? What is his relationship with the Father? What does he do? Like, we're going to literally learn a lot about Jesus. Um, beautiful doctrine. And we're also going to learn about Jesus by the way that he serves other people and miracles that he performs as well. So kind of the best of both worlds, I feel like, as we're studying these chapters this week. There's two events that are kind of the main focus. Um, I, I know my brain loves to know, like, what are we... What are we focusing on this week? To me, there are two pretty clear main events that are in Matthew and Mark and John. <laughs> John usually does his own thing, right? He has like a lot of separate stories. And in fact, John chapter five is totally unique and, and different this week. But John chapter six is actually pretty parallel to Matthew 14 and Mark six as well. So we get some parallel stories this week in John. Two things. First story is Jesus feeding the multitude of 5,000 with the five loaves of bread and two fishes. Um, we actually studied, the, we, we read this in Luke um, a few weeks ago, but I told you then that wasn't the main focus. Here, now it's the main focus um, to look at all the different details that the different authors include as they record this miracle, right? There's millions of details to every story that you could possibly include. So it's interesting to look and see which details the different authors decided to pick, right? The other one is Jesus walking on water. Jesus walking on water, a fantastic miracle. Again, look for the different details that the different authors include as they tell this story, including 
Peter's involvement. <laughs> I know a lot of us, when we hear that story, we think of Peter walking on water, um, but not all of the authors include the account of Peter. So keep a lookout for that as well. And then, like I said, there's also amazing doctrine-rich teachings about Jesus himself, especially in the book of John. John is a fantastic author at recording all of these deep doctrinal teachings. Um, but not too deep, like not too heavy. It is it is good, powerful stuff. Um, I would recommend for sure if if you're used to like reading in small chunks or a few verses here and there, I would read John chapter five all in one go. I think it helps sometimes to read like an entire thing all in one go and get like, oh, okay, I see what he was saying instead of just like, okay. I'll read a few more verses of this heavy doctrine or whatever. So um, really good stuff. Okay, I think that's it. Let's talk about specifically what you'll see in each chapter now. So let's start with Matthew chapter 14. We start off with a not so happy event, and that is that Herod, Herod the Tetrarch, as he's sometimes called, beheads John the Baptist. He was tricked into beheading the John the Baptist, and you'll see that story unfold in Matthew 14. However, we know that Herod wanted John the Baptist dead. John the Baptist had criticized Herod and his marriage. And so Herod wanted John the Baptist dead, but John the Baptist was so popular. So popular. I feel like <laughs> there's so much we don't know about John the Baptist. I want to read a book all about him in the next life because... I just feel like we only get these little glimpses and like prophecies of how important he is and like just tiny little stories of him doing things. And it's like, I want to know more about John. Um, but John the Baptist was so popular that Herod was like, I can't put John to death because the crowds would riot. But we get an account of Herod finally being tricked into beheading John the Baptist. Now, as you can imagine, after hearing this news, Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins. They were relatives. And so... He, and we also assume pretty close friends. Um, and so at hearing this news, we see Jesus wanting to go to be alone. And as he goes to be alone, the crowds follow him asking for miracles. And he turns around and he heals them. He heals them. We then transition into the story of Jesus needing to feed the crowd that's in front of him. And there's no food. Um, and so he performs the miracle of feeding 5,000. Now it says 5,000 men. So it's possible that there were more people in attendance, but there were at least 5,000 men. Um, he feeds them with five loaves of bread and two fishes. Again, look for the different details that the different authors include. Now, after this, um, Jesus sends his apostles out on the water and it mentions the fourth watch. The fourth watch is when this occurs. The fourth watch was in between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Not a great time to be awake, although if you've got little kids, I'm with you. We're awake during those times. Um, 3 to 6 a.m. is the fourth watch. That is when Jesus then walks on the water out to his apostles. And in Matthew, this is when we get the account of Peter then walking on the water. Don't shortchange Peter here. Peter walks on water. Amazing miracle. Um, then Peter gets distracted by the, the winds and, and everything going on around him and he starts to fall and he calls out for help and immediately Jesus saves him. Beautiful story. Love that story. I want to talk about that story a lot more. Um, and then we end with back on shore. There's a lot of, um, a lot of crowds, a lot of people wanting Jesus to heal him and many are healed just by touching the hem of Jesus's robes. Okay, now let's talk about Mark chapter six. We have actually not been in the book of Mark for a few weeks either. Um, in fact, when we left off in Mark five, that was the story of Jesus raising Jairus's daughter from the dead and the woman with the issue of blood being healed. So it's been a few weeks. Um, but now we start in Mark chapter six with Jesus being kind of rejected by the people in his homeland and sending forth his 12 apostles. Um, we've read about this in other chapters. And then we get the account of John the Baptist being beheaded. We get Jesus wanting to go to a solitary place. We get the crowds following him. Jesus has compassion on them and still heals them. Jesus feeds the crowd of 5,000. And then Jesus walks on water. We don't get any account of Peter um, in the book of Mark. And then returning back to shore and people being healed just by touching the hem of Jesus's garment. So very parallel chapters right there in Matthew and Mark. Okay, now let's go to John. John chapter five, like I said, this one is totally different. This one is not parallel at all in, in 
true John fashion. Um, this starts with the story of a man at the Pool of Bethesda. Now, the Pool of Bethesda had a really interesting legend around it. We really don't get many details, um, and I think it's just kind of interesting that <laughs> it's just kind of there, and we figure it out. Um, but the legend was that when an angel stirred the waters of the Pool of Bethesda, the first person into the pool would then be healed. So as you can imagine with a legend like that, a lot of sick and injured and disabled people would surround this pool, hoping to be the first one in the water after they would see the waters being stirred. But we get the story this week of a man and he was so disabled that he was never going to be the first one into the water. He was too slow. He couldn't get to the water fast enough. And so he's here with his little bed and with his little caught mat here and he's trying to be the first one in the pool but he's never going to be the first one in the pool and this is also on the sabbath day of course <laughs> this is on the sabbath day and jesus comes and he sees this man by the pool of bethesda and this man needs to be healed and jesus heals this man he can get up he can walk his ailment is fixed and at this point jesus says take your bed and leave go i command you to leave you are healed go and so this man picks up his bed and he walks away now as he's doing this the jewish leadership they see this man walking with his bed which you cannot do on the sabbath day and so they're coming to this man they're like you can't walk around on the sabbath holding your bed what are you doing and this man just says listen the man who healed me commanded me to take up my bed and walk and so i am doing that and they're like who who healed you? What are you talking about? And when they make the connection that this is Jesus, oh, does the persecution start to build. Um, this, I feel like the book of John shows the most out of all the books by far, how this persecution against Jesus starts to escalate amongst the Pharisees and Jewish leadership in general. So we're about halfway through the four gospels at this point, right? We've got about three months left in them. So we're going to start seeing, especially in the book of John, just this persecution building. You're going to get so frustrated with the Pharisees reading about everything that they're like accusing Jesus of. You're like, no, how could you not see this? How could you not see this? So these Jews are accusing Jesus um, of violating the Sabbath. Um, and what is he doing thinking that he can heal? Um, but this man that was healed at the pool of Bethesda just kind of bears his quiet testimony. Like he, he healed me. <laughs> He healed me and I am being obedient to what this man says. Um, and in fact, Jesus then finds this man the, at the, who was healed at the pool of Bethesda afterwards and forgives him of his sins and gives him some more directions as well. Really sweet interaction with them. And then in the rest of John 5, like I mentioned, we get Jesus teaching about himself. He talks about his purpose, his relationship with God the Father. He talks about the gift of the Holy Ghost and the purpose of the Holy Ghost. He talks about his resurrection um, that will eventually happen. Just beautiful, beautiful doctrinal teachings here. All right, and then we move on to John chapter 6, our final chapter. This one is the one that's more parallel to the other ones. So we start with multitudes following Jesus to a mountain where he realizes he needs to feed them. And in John's account of this, we see Philip and Andrew find a lad who has five loaves of bread and two fishes, and they're able to feed the multitude and have lots left over as well um, within that miracle. We then have the story of his apostles sailing out at sea and Jesus walking on water to go and meet them. Um, and then he goes back and, and in the other chapters, we learned that there's this kind of like a crowd waiting for him and they're wanting him to heal him. And a lot of them are healed by touching the hem of Jesus' garment, right? And in this account in John chapter six, we see that Jesus teaches the people. It sounds like the people are like, we heard you fed the multitude, like feed us, give us food, feed us. And Jesus says, listen, if you want the meat that leads to eternal life, follow me. And they're very confused. And he starts teaching about eating his flesh and drinking his blood and how that is what leads to eternal life. And boy, does the multitude not want to hear this. They are very offended and confused and and thrown off by what, is te what he's teaching, and a lot of people leave Jesus after this point. A lot of disciples, not the 12 apostles, but a lot of other disciples leave Jesus at this point as well, and they, they walk away. They leave. 
And then the cool thing is that Peter <laughs> then says, Jesus, we're not going anywhere. We don't have anywhere else to go. We are with you to the end. Um, you are the Messiah. Now, um, that should cover it for this week. I think my personal focus question for this week, I mean, you have to focus on Peter. You don't have to. I have to focus on Peter. I just love the story of Peter walking on water. And so I want to think this week, what did Peter do right? Because he did a lot of things right. And what did Peter do not so right? <laughs> There's some mistakes he made too, right? And I think I can learn from both of those. I want to be more like Peter in a lot of ways. And also I want to learn from Peter's mistakes as well. Um, and also even at the end of John chapter 6, Peter gives some great teachings as well um, with his small little testimony. So I want to look at Peter this week. What can I learn from him from what he did right? And what can I learn from him on how to improve um, in my situation as well? Okay, have a great week this week. Have a great general conference. Easter week next week. So much good stuff going on. Happy studying.